next service. Let's pray together, shall we? Dear Lord, we thank you once again for those who are going to be baptized today. We thank you for their testimonies and we pray for your gracious blessing upon each one of them. And now as we turn to your word, we pray that it would also touch our hearts even as we just heard a moment ago in Jack's testimony how you used your word through the Sunday school class, through the, his reading of the Bible to touch him, to show him that you were after him. You had a plan for his life. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we have the joy of witnessing um, these seven folks being baptized. Three, uh, th four ladies and three guys, I think it is. And so we're going to have a shorter message today. And uh, it's the last one in our series on John 17. And so we're going to look mainly at the last two verses, those two verses that um, Ivy read for us a moment ago. And we're going to have two headings. The first one is Jesus prays to the Father, and then we'll think about Jesus prays for us. And this has been the theme all the way through, of course, isn't it? Because Jesus, all the way through, is speaking to his Father, and he's praying for us. But he starts the prayer with that word, Father, and he uses the word uh, in Aramaic, which was a language that Jesus spoke, actually, similar to Hebrew, but the, uh, it's the, the Aramaic language. It was the word Abba. Abba. It's a bit like in English we use uh, the word Daddy. Now, Daddy is a very uh, intimate but very loving, close, respectful term for a father. And that's the word that Jesus used for his father. And the amazing truth is that he also tells us that we can call God Father. We can call God Daddy. I mean, this is mind-blowing, really, isn't it? Jesus taught us, and this is the real Lord's, well, we call this the Lord's Prayer, although John 17 is really the Lord's, the Lord's Prayer. But this prayer that we pray very often in church, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, is really the prayer the Lord taught us to pray. But he's teaching, telling us we can call God Father. This is the amazing thing. There's something very special, something very unique about Christianity here in this very, uh, in this very truth, that God is our Father. He's not some remote, far away, angry or mysterious uh, deity out there somewhere. He is a loving father. And uh, there's a wonderful book that was written by a lady called Bilquis Sheik. And uh, she was a member of a wealthy, influential Muslim family in Pakistan. And she became a Christian and uh, wrote this book, I Dared to Call Him Father. And it's interesting to see her story. I think we've got the book in the library, actually, and uh, you, you might be interested to read it. She, she actually um, had dreams about Jesus. She was in Pakistan, this uh, very influential Muslim family. She had dreams about G uh, Jesus, and she uh, got hold of a Bible and started reading the Bible. And one day she took one of her um, nephews or nieces or something to the hospital, and at the hospital she met a doctor. Actually, it was a Catholic uh, nun, a Christian lady doctor, and uh, she was uh, reading her Bible there, and this doctor, uh, also Pakistani, but a Christian, uh, spoke to her and said, Oh, uh, you're a Muslim. How, uh, how come you're reading the Bible, you know? And uh, the, the lady, a uh, sheik, told her, it's because I, I, I'm interested in finding out about God. And so uh, the doctor told her, well, maybe you should pray to God and ask God to reveal himself to you, to show himself to you. And she suggested that when she prays to God, she talks to him like she would talk to her own father. Now this appealed to Sheik because she had a good relationship with her father. Now some people who don't have a good relationship with a fa their father might think, oh, how do I talk to my father? I want to talk to God like I talk to my dad. 
But in her case, uh, her dad was very loving, kind to her, and she felt, okay, I talk to God like I talk to my dad. And she did. And she asked God to show himself to her. And the amazing thing is he did. He showed himself to Sheik, and she became a Christian and was baptized. And then, uh, well, she suffered a lot as a result, of course. She was cut off from her family and friends and all kinds of stories. You can read it in the book. But she wrote this book, I Dared to Call Him Father. And it was this realization that God was Father that was a key thing in helping her come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so, in verse 11, we find... Uh, not only does Jesus talk about pray to the Father, but he calls his Father Holy Father. And in verse 25 that we read a moment ago, he talks about righteous Father. God is holy and he's righteous. Our Father is holy. No earthly father can compare with the Heavenly Father, actually. Our Heavenly Father is perfect. He's holy and he's righteous. And he's our Creator. And the fact that our Creator is holy and righteous is also very, very significant. You know, God established physical laws in the universe. They govern the universe. For example, the force of gravity, uh, the, the law of aerodynamics. I don't understand them all. But they are they're physical laws that govern the universe. If you climb up on the top of the building and jump down, you are going to prove the law of gravity. You can't defy it. You'll prove it. You'll illustrate it. Because you'll come crashing down. <laughs> you won't be able to fly. So these are things that God has established, and science is built on the fact that there are physical laws upholding the universe. But God has also established a moral law, because God is holy, and he's righteous. And he's established the moral laws which are, in a way, crystallized in the Ten Commandments. They're very basic, but they're there, and if we try to defy them, we're going to get into trouble too. Just like you jump off the roof, you get into trouble by trying to break the physical laws, and we break the moral laws, we're going to suffer the consequences. And so, without the moral law, our society is adrift on a sea of relativism. Everything's relative. Oh, yeah, that can be good for you. Doesn't necessarily be good for me. That can be right for you. Doesn't mean it's right for me. That's what our society is like today. Everything's relative. We're tossed about by the winds, by the currents of public opinion. Whatever is politically correct and we just chuck tr truth out the window. We don't care about what's right and wrong, we just go with whatever is popular at the time. And so this is the problem when we as human beings put God's moral law to the side. But what this prayer of Jesus can tell us is that God is holy, God is righteous, he's the creator, he's our father, he's our God, and he has given us these laws for our blessing, for our benefit. And so this, when, when, uh, this God whom Jesus calls Father, he is this holy and righteous one. But very sadly, we find here in verse 25, Jesus goes on to say to his Father, the world does not know you. This is a sad truth about society today. People don't know God. That's what Ian was telling us, that spark, you know, let's pass it on. People don't know, so let's pass on the good news. People sometimes are ignorant, and uh, sometimes people uh, are, are deliberately turning away from God's truth. They choose to disregard God's truth. And New Zealand used to be a God-fearing nation. And New Zealand used to be uh, sending out many missionaries, uh, proportionate to the population, one of the highest proportions in the world, sending out uh, all over the world, even to China, Japan. And so it's a new generation, and this country 
once again needs the gospel because there's an ignorance of God's word in the land. There's a famine of God's word in the land. So that's why we must pray for all the churches to be faithful in preaching God's truth and, be faith and pray that all of us as Christians would be faithful in living out our Christian faith in the marketplace because people need the Lord. People don't know the Lord. The world does not know him. And they will only come to know him through you and through me. And the wonderful thing is, God still wants people to come to know him. God is not uh, far away, uninterested in what's going on. He wants us to know him. And so we see Jesus speaking to the Father. He says, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. Jesus reveals himself to his followers and he still reveals himself today, just like he did to, to Bilquis Sheik in Pakistan and like those two young people we read about in Morocco and in Saudi Arabia and uh, here in New Zealand, those being baptized today. I remember last, the last baptism we had, Henry told us, I remember with Lyndon and, and Henry, we, the three of us prayed out there and uh, Henry said, we, he said, all right, I'll pray to God. God, if you're real, show yourself to me. He meant it. And God really did wonderfully speak into Henry's life. And uh, he was baptized after that, as you know. So the good news is to be proclaimed through the lives of God's people. And that more and more people will come to know the Lord Jesus. Now, many of you have grown up in countries where you don't have the opportunity to hear the good news. And those like those being baptized, several have said they came to faith here in New Zealand. But seeds were sown back there in China. So wherever you are, God wants you to know him. That's the wonderful truth. And all who come to know Jesus can call him Father. That's the wonderful thing. Jesus prays to the Father and we can pray to the Father. And so secondly and lastly, Jesus prays for us. You remember, we've talked in the last few weeks about, in this series about how uh, Jesus prays that we as Christians will be characterized by different things. Characterized by truth. Characterized by holiness. By joy. By mission. By going out, telling the good news. By unity. And by glory that we thought of last week. He also prays for us that we will be protected from the evil one. And that's something we need so much, don't we? Especially those being baptized. As the evil one attacks us, that we'll be protected. So if you're a Christian, don't be surprised when Satan has a go at you. You know, he always is thinking of ways to trip us up. He wants to get us to fight with our spouse. He wants to get us to be upset with our kids. Or to be mad at this or mad at that. Or he brings up some pornography on the computer screen. Just when we're doing something what we should be doing, up comes this jolly image and there's a temptation for us to... All kinds of ways Satan is, is out there trying to trip us up, trying to discourage us, trying to make us feel we're useless, we're no good. Don't be fooled by Satan. Let's claim this prayer of Jesus, protection from the evil one. And I'm so glad that Jesus prays for us because he wants us to experience these things, to be characterized by these things. And today, there's, even some, there's something wonderful in this final verse that he prays. He wants us to be characterized by his love. He wants us to get to know the Father better. These are two wonderful truths as well, aren't they? Jesus goes on to pray, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known to them. There's so much more, isn't there? for us to learn about Jesus, about the Father. And there's, there, there's an important principle here. If we want to get to know God better, we need to spend time with him. And how do we spend time with God? We need to read his word. We need to pray. We need to come to his house to fellowship with other believers. You know, those who think they can be a Christian on their own out there, they're soon going to lose their zeal and their love for the Lord. We need one another. And also to witness to, to others in a loving, sensible, reasonable way, of course, but to share your faith. 
All these things strengthen us in our walk with the Lord Jesus. So these are ways that we can get to know the Father better, and it's Jesus' prayer for us. I heard about a father who went fishing with his son. He spent the day fishing with his son. And in his diary that night, his fa the father wrote this. He said, wasted the whole day fishing with my son. How do you think he was feeling during the day when he's teaching his son about fishing? He was frustrated because he had more important things to do, right? He wanted to go and make more money. He, was, he had all these phone calls to make. Here he is with his son, wasting his day fishing. Unless he's a dad who loves fishing. But obviously he didn't think of the fishing even. But he wasted the day. But what did the son think about it? Years later, the son said this. One of the highlights of my childhood was a day I spent fishing with my dad. What a difference, right? And so here it is. If we spend time with our children as fathers, as parents, it's going to make an impact upon their lives. They're going to always remember it. The precious memories from our childhood. But unlike the father that I've just mentioned, unlike that father is our father in heaven. He loves to spend time with us. He loves it when we come into his presence. He's waiting. He's waiting for us. He's waiting for us to spend time with him. He's wanting to show us more and more of his beauty and his wisdom, his love. So don't be afraid to go to God. He's not an angry God. You can say, what are you doing yesterday? He said, I'm so glad you came. Let's talk. I want to help you. I want to encourage you. This is our Heavenly Father. He's a wonderful Father. He just loves us to come into His presence. And He will make Himself known to us. So how about you? Are you, are you so busy that you ha hardly have any time for God? Oh yes, you're an important person, maybe. You've got lots of important things to do. So perhaps you're too busy to spend time with God. Well, if you're too busy to spend time with God, then you're just too busy. That's the, uh, the, simple, the simple thing. And the busier we are, the busier we are, maybe the more time we need to spend with God. Funny, isn't it? The busier we are, maybe the more time we need to spend with Him. Now finally, notice this very important thing that Jesus says right at the end of the prayer, the last phrase, and why does he say, I'm going to reveal myself more and more to them? It's in order that the love you have for me may be in them. That's an awesome thought. Jesus is praying that that perfect love that was between the Father and the Son would be in us as well. That we would be characterized by love, by God's love. Now that, I mean, we could have a whole sermon just on that, right? Because... We've talked about truth and about joy and about all these other things, unity and glory, but here is something very special too. That love that the Father had for the Son and the Son had for the Father, that perfect love, it is a supernatural love, just like Christian joy is supernatural. It's not, it's not just a normal kind of joy. And just like a unity, Christian unity is supernatural. It's not just organized into existence and so too with God's love God's love is so deep it's so powerful it's really supernatural because God loves those who don't deserve his love God loves us even when we were uh, in rebellion against him like Jack said not even interested he locked God out of his heart yet God's love was still there like the father waiting for the son to come home and what about us? Do we have that love? We need that supernatural love. Because, you know, it's easy to love people who are nice and kind to us. People who smile and friendly and support us and, and do all kinds of good things for us. Easy to love them. But what about the people who cheat us? What about the people who are unkind to us? Who stab us in the back? The people who criticize us? The people who make life difficult for us? 
Do we love them? Can we pray like the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us? That requires supernatural love, the love of Jesus to fill our hearts. And so Jesus ends his prayer with another wonderful thought that I myself may be in them. He says may, may, he wants the, the Father to continue. He's going to continue to reveal himself to us He's going to, so that we can know more of his love. And then he says that I myself may be in them. This is the key to living the Christian life. The presence of Jesus living inside of us. He lives inside every Christian by the indwelling power and presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, this is a wonderful truth. When you go, so sometimes we think, oh, I could never be a Christian. It's, it's, it's too difficult. And you're right. It is too difficult. We can't be Christians in our own strength. But the wonderful truth is, Christian life is when he's living in us by his spirit, day by day. He's right there with us. Michael Cassidy, who, whose book has been a great help to me in this series, I've mentioned him a few times, Michael uh, talked about a, a conversation he had with Bill Bright, Dr. Bill Bright. He's a famous Christian leader who's now with the Lord. He was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, a student ministry, mainly in the United States, but now worldwide. And Dr. Bright said this to Michael Cassidy one time. He said, Michael, living the Christian life is not just difficult. It is impossible. And the only person who can live it is Jesus Christ. So we have to have him in our hearts. Otherwise, we can only fail. Well, the good news is that Jesus is alive and he wants to live in our hearts today. And every true believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. And our prayer is today for those being baptized that they will be filled with the Holy Spirit and they will experience Jesus living in them day by day. They'll never turn back. And that's what they're saying in their, as they baptize today. Jesus is my Lord. He's living in my heart and I want to live for him for the rest of my life. So by his power, by his grace, may each one of us know the Father more and more and may we also come to know more of the love of Jesus in our hearts and may we experience more and more of the leading of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts day by day. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, we thank you for the wonderful truth of your word that Jesus is alive and our faith is not just theory, not just some kind of fancy philosophy, but this is real. And God, the creator, this holy, awesome God, is also our Father. And so we want to open our hearts to you, Father, to know you more and more, to experience your love filling our hearts, and to know the presence of the Lord Jesus with us day by day as King in our hearts, ruling as Lord and Master, and filling us with the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that you've promised to be with us forever until Jesus, you come again. We thank you for your word. Thank you for this wonderful prayer of Jesus in John 17 that we've been looking at over these past several weeks. Lord, may we be characterized more and more by all these beautiful things that we've been thinking about. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.